Welcome back to Tracklandia. A lot's happened since we last saw each other. We miss seeing your face. We always love to see your face. But for now, we're going to be in the garage for the foreseeable future. And this could be a garage anywhere, any place, um, anybody's garage. Just imagine a garage. But for now, it's my garage and it's anywhere. So we're going to have a lot of high profile guests joining us in this garage, many accomplished guests, interesting people with interesting stories to tell and uh we're gonna have many of them on regularly we're gonna never invite some of them back we're gonna talk to some people on the face phone as well some people around the country hear how they're doing hear their joys their woes their struggles all those things we're gonna talk to people like rj mcnichols rw mccorders rl stein maybe scrooge mcduck we're also gonna talk to you about some crazy experimental things that we're working on too in tracklandia because you know we like to do that uh, different production elements that we're going to be working on for races or different films that are being made, different artistic endeavors, different shows that we're working on. You'll all you'll hear that all happening here. And uh, this is Tracklandia. We've got a flag on the moon. Speaking of the moon, you remember this summer uh, where we took you to the Big Friendly series, also known as the 2020 Tracklandia Space Race Program. We had five meets here in Oregon with some of the best groups in the world competing. And we read the comment section actually, and there were a lot of comments on there speculating as to whether I was high while I was commentating. And uh, yes, yes, we do read the comment section. And even though we did hit the Taco Bell drive-thru every time after we left the meet, that doesn't mean that I have to be high while I'm comment commentating, all right? Like, and I know there are many people who want me to denounce marijuana right here, right now. What do you want me to do? What, what do you want me to say? Like, good, JJ, give me a name. Give me, like, what do you want? Maui what, Wowie. What, Maui Wowie. Ma so, Maui Wowie, what else? What do we want? Ganja. Like, ganja. Maui Wowie, Ganja, stand back and stand by. Okay. Now, yeah, back to the Big Friendly series. Glad we, we're glad we settled that. Yeah, we had the OTC, the Brooks Beast. Wazelle Little Wing, the Tin Men, Golden Coast through uh, Eric Avila in there. BTC was there too. And of course, you know, uh, Pete's Riverboats Gamblers were also there. They were a big fan favorite. Uh, and a number of others too were joining us at the Big Friendly Series. Some local favorites. Eleanor Fulton took home two victories. The Pride of Portland, as we like to call her. Uh, the final team score for the Big Friendly Series this year. We didn't have official team scoring there, but we want to breathe that into, uh, into the sport because these teams are forming and they want to compete against each other, and we're going to be showing that in the future. But the final team score in third place was Brooks Beast, and they took home four total wins across the five competitions. Second place, we had the OTC, and they had seven wins. And then, even though they only competed in three of the five big friendly races, 2020 Tracklandia Space Race Program, your champions, Donnie Braz and the Friendly Bunch. Donnie Braz, he does not like to be called that. Remember that, Donovan Brazier, call him DB. And then on a, on a different note here, the bigger friendly held at the McKenzie River track, which is a beautiful track set just east of Eugene in the, in the hills. Uh, lovely setting, and you all remember it occurring on July 17th. Uh, later on in the summer, around Labor Day, that area was devastated by the Holiday Farm fire, and the entire town of Blue River uh, next to the track was uh, destroyed. And luckily, we had heard that no lives were lost in this particular fire in the state, but many people lost their homes. Yeah, our hearts go out to, to the community there. We heard from people in the area that the track had been used as a safe haven for evacuations. Families gathered there until it was safe for them to be shepherded out of the, the area, and firefighters dumped water around the track to protect them while they were situated there. A devastating thing for everybody involved and, and for everybody who, who knows about it too. Uh, it was heartbreaking. Actually, there was a cool idea that came out of this from photographers who uh, took photos at the meet. And a few of them are getting together, Tim Healy, Howard Lau, and Jake Willard. And we're creating an Etsy site 
where we will be selling photos from that particular meet, uh, and all of the proceeds will go to the Mackenzie River Community Recovery Fund. So be on the lookout for that, and you can see more communication from us on our social media and all of that stuff. But uh, if you don't want to buy a beautiful photo, then please consider giving to any community in the state or on the West Coast that was affected by these uh, fires this summer, too. So we have a marathon coming up in December, switching gears. And we'll be talking to Scott Fobble pretty soon. And he will be competing in that marathon. He's down in Arizona at the moment training. But before we get to that, uh, I just want to take a moment to recognize our sponsors. As always, this is brought to you by Portland Track and Toilet Paper Roomba. Stick with us. We'll be back with Scott Fobble. And then later in the show, we'll be talking to Liz Anjos, our very own Liz Anjos from Portland. She's one of the founders of the Rose City Track Club. And she played keyboard in the Tracklandia band most recently at one of our live shows. And she is now the second fastest woman to have ever completed the Appalachian Trail. So stick with us. We're checking in with Scott Fobble here. Uh, Fobbs, as you know him. Oh, yeah. Live long and prosper. What's up? How's it going? Oh, is, are you working on your signs now for when you cross the finish line? I think you've always got to be practicing your finish line celebration. I've been workshopping some things. The live long and prosper is in the rotation, but um, I can't commit to it at this juncture. I feel like if you try to do anything like that with, with any part of your body at the end of a marathon, things would just cramp up. There's a very good chance my elbow would fall off my body if I tried it. I think that's a good point, Jeff. Well, we're talking to you today uh, because you're building up for a race, the marathon yep. project, December 20th. Yeah. How does it feel to have a race back on the calendar? Man, I'm psyched about this. Um, yeah, it was, uh, you know, the summer was tough, I think, for a lot of people. I'm not going to say that I was above, like, letting my motivation slip and um, not being as diligent as I uh, usually am. And I think that was mostly because I wasn't particularly excited for the stuff coming up. Like, we had an opportunity to race a 5,000 on the track, and that was great. That was a lot of fun. I'm thankful we got the opportunity, but I don't really enjoy track. I don't don't like it very much. Um, I don't think it fits my skill set. So like uh, this just feels more natural to get psyched up for. I don't feel like I have to conjure any um, any extra motivation for it. So uh, this feels really kind of more similar to a normal season, I guess, than than we have for a while. Yeah, you're you're one of those guys who likes to take people out and just drag them around for a long time on the road and beat them up. Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know that this is necessarily like it. Like I wish I wish I was a miler. I think like most people, sure. I wish that I could, I had a 50 on the last lap in my bag. But the yeah. thing is I don't, and I like winning. I like doing well at things um, like most humans. Uh, so I kind of have to play to my strengths in that regard. Totally. No, and I don't begrudge you for that. That You do yeah. what you need to do. Yeah. So how is this build up going so far? It's good. I mean, we're just getting into it. Um, I don't feel like we've done much marathon specific work. I think our longest workout so far has been 15 by K. So that's a little over nine miles. So we got all the hard work ahead of us, but, um, tomorrow, actually, uh, we head to Michigan for two races. We're got, we got the Ekaden. Yeah. And then a week later we have a half marathon. So, um, I'm excited for that opportunity. And then once we get back from that, the marathon segment will start. I kind of went over the template with Ben not the template, sorry, the schedule with Ben earlier this week. And it looks great. It looks like it's going to be really hard. It looks like we're going to push the, the envelope in a couple of places, kind of back to sort of the stuff that I really like doing, or I'm good at doing. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm pretty excited for this Ekiden thing. I think that's really good for the sport. I like these team competitions and the Ekiden format is, is really cool and something that the U.S. could really, uh, or it could bring the sport into more relevancy in the U.S., I think. so pumped to see that but back to the training aspect you've got some young guns on the team now some young bucks who've come in uh are they are they helping or hurting your build-up do you think well um you know rory is very enthusiastic and that's great but that's not me so in that regard he and tyler you know they're they come in they come in happy to practice every single day they haven't been beaten down 
I hate that. by five years in the professional game. Um, they're not tired yet. They're not tired enough yet, in my opinion. So their sort of overwhelming positive enthusiasm is a huge bummer for me. It's just, uh, it just pulls me into the muck even farther. And I just have to, I feel like I have to go even farther negative in order to balance them. Yeah. Um, See, that, yeah. That's interesting that you say that because I feel the same way in, in different interactions with people. Like you'll always hear meet somebody on their energy level. Like, mm -hmm. but that's not, I, I go the exact opposite of what somebody's energy level is to balance out, like to bring the whole thing back to equilibrium. You're more of an averages guy. Like you're yeah. not gonna, you want the, you want an average sort of thing. Yeah. If I can't get to their enthusiasm level, which I can't anymore, I'm an old man at mm -hmm. this point. I'm grumpy. I'm set in my ways. Yeah. Oh, you don't need and, to tell me. Uh, right. Yeah. It's obvious. <laughs> we know. Yeah. yeah. And when they're coming in, they're coming in hot every single day. And that's wonderful. That's wonderful for the team atmosphere and stuff. For my personal atmosphere, like I would rather just like listen to NPR and go on a walk, you know, like I don't, I don't need enthusiasm to get through my day anymore. I'm just waiting until my body fails me. You know, uh, physically, it's been great. We've really meshed well. They pulled me through some workouts. Are there things that, that you've helped them learn uh, as they've come in? And uh, you think, hey, this is something that we can work on. I'm going to shepherd you through this. I, in, or I told Tyler when he signed his contract, I gave him my accountant's information. So I think on that regard, like I really put in my veteran leadership early. And now I'm kind of resting on my laurels until, until he needs some more tax help, which I can refer him to, uh, to a good help, uh, accountant. That's good. Yeah, you really are taking the, the role of the old guy on the team here. Yeah, Scott Smith is, uh, he's really the father of the team in a lot of ways, but he's getting ready to pass on, you know, I mean, not dead, but he's an <laughs> old guy, he's 34 years old. Uh, and as I think kind of like the second oldest guy on the team, I've sort of assumed the role of the, the cantankerous uncle. And I'm just going to keep leaning into that, you know, the cantankerous uncle, he's got his business contacts. He's, um, he's grumpy. He listens to, listens to talk radio. And he's got his opinions that he's not going to deviate from them. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Everybody's a bit of a grump, or a grumpy uncle these days. With their yeah. opinions, I think. Yeah. What What's uh, What's motivating your build up this this year to that to the big race on December twentieth? Do you have? Yeah. I mean, we were texting earlier. I said I'm rereading the uh, The Road by Cormac McCarthy. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So that's. I think that's a really good book for a marathon buildup because it's just, it's really just about suffering. It's just about making it to the next day. It's just mm -hmm. dealing with today's challenges and going forward really for the sake of going forward. Is there a particular line in the book? Like I know when I was reading uh, your build up to New York in the, in the book that you wrote, like something that would constantly be in your head was uh, fuck with me. You know, I got it. And yeah. that, would just, that would, yeah, kick you right into gear. From the book, I read a line that I thought was really good. Um, it's not necessarily informing my build. I got a different one for that. But the book was, there is no God and we are his prophets, which I just haven't been able to. That's like something you sit in the bath and think about. And you're like, oh, fuck, there is no God. And we are his prophets. Um, yeah, and you just think about any, that for hours. There aren't any sharp objects around the bath while you're sitting in there. No, no just kind of sitting there and just, just thinking about it for hours. Sometimes... Sometimes days, really. I haven't been able to get it out of my head. Um, but no, I think in terms of my own personal like mantra right now, it's uh, acceptance without pacificity. Mm. Meaning like, you know, right now there are things that we can't control. And um, it would be like, I don't think it would be helpful to deny them. Like we've, we as a world got dealt a shit hand right now. You know, I haven't been the healthiest I've ever been over the last year, last year and a half even. And um I think that sort of goes in the same bucket. Like I have to accept that, like I have to do a lot of shit that I don't like right now. Like I have to do rehab and I have to do these exercises and these mobility things and these stretches and rolling and all the stuff that like the stuff that I don't really like about running, I have to do it. And um, so I'm level headed about that. And I accept the fact that that's true, but um, I don't think like, I guess the not being passive part is the actually like doing the rehab not just accepting the fact that my body doesn't hasn't been responding as well over the last year and a half as it did previously. That sounds very Zen, like a, almost like a Bruce Lee kind of mantra, like 
absorb absorb the blows and then respond to them kind of yeah uh i mean i didn't i didn't think of it luckily i mean it was our sports psych who uh who introduced me to that phrase so um all the credit goes to her she's much more zen than me nice yeah yeah i'm just parrot i'm just repeating what she said yeah what's the goal for this thing is it uh is it time oriented or are you going for the win i think the goal for me is always to win like i don't or is to place as high as i can and to race as well as i can um and i i've always been of the opinion that good times come from that like all of my prs have come from races where like the goal wasn't just to get in a line and rip it was to it was to make people hurt, it was to make myself hurt, it was to make moves, it was to go for the win at the end. You know, like my 28 flat, 10,000, I was with Shadrach, Kipchurcher, and Lenny career until 100 meters to go. You know, I was trying to win that race. The 102.18, I ran at Great North. I was trying to finish as high as possible. Uh, 209 in Boston, like I was trying to win the thing. Um, so I think if I go with that same attitude, the time will come. And hopefully, you know, I think the hope of this race in general is um that it will be fast it'll be really quick we're gonna have pacers we're gonna it's gonna be a really fast course um should have a lot of guys and there should be it should be relatively cooperative um it's really flat so i don't see why a fast time can't come as a product of trying to win well this is going to be this is going to be really interesting and uh we hope to check in with you periodically throughout your build up to this race and uh and see what you are. but yeah. um Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So I was going to say it'll go great. It'll be great. Can't wait to do this again. Yeah, always. I mean, we always have a good time. Yeah. But hey, good luck. Uh, good luck out in Michigan. Also the promised land. Yeah. And we'll be talking to you soon. Any yeah. parting words for us? Uh, just thanks for doing this. I'm excited for, to excited to race. And I'm happy that you guys are excited about the event, too. And, um, uh, you know. I just as much momentum as we can get for this thing would be awesome. So thank you guys for your interest. Yeah. As live long and prosper. See you, brother. See ya. Thank you, Scott, for that wonderful talk. Uh, now we're back in the garage. And we've got Liz Anjos here. Liz, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, Liz, we uh, we gave you a glowing introduction right before we talked to Scott. Uh, you are one of the founders of the Rose City Track Club, one of the esteemed groups in the Portland area. And you are an accomplished musician as well. And you are a fantastic trail runner, an ultra runner. And you are now the second fastest woman to have ever completed the Appalachian Trail, which is, we were just talking about this before uh, you before we started this, but yeah, we're it's like oh Liz went out and she like ran a trail for a while, and yeah, it's a big accomplishment to be the second fastest ever to do something. But can you take us into the sheer magnitude of this? Hit us with some numbers here on the distance and all that stuff. Yeah, so the trail starts in Georgia and ends in Maine. It's 2,193 miles. Um, let's see, the, so the, the overall record was set by Carol Save. He's a dentist from Belgium. He did it in just over 41 days. The women's record is held by Jennifer Farr Davis. She completed the trail in 46 days and 11 hours. Um, and so you take 2,193 miles in that amount of days. Uh, so between the two of them, that's ranging from 47 to 53 miles a day. Um, <laughs> Which is just and, ridiculous. Yeah, and um, and I and so I, I finished the trail in 51 days, 16 hours, 30 minutes. I um, I ended up averaging for 42 miles a day. And then this isn't like going out, I mean, 42 miles a day is, I mean, that's a, that's a big bike ride. And I know that I've said that to you before, and that is the equivalent of a, oh, I don't even drive my car that far, <laughs> which no runner wants to hear. <laughs> so, but it's, it's something that I can't wrap my head around that you, for 51 days, you went out and did somewhere around 40 to 50 miles a day. 
Yeah. And, and even like, even though like I average also 42 miles, my, my longest day, which is actually my first day, but I did 69 miles my first day, but then like somewhere in between or in like around halfway through, I only did 12 miles. So there is a big range in there. Which is still 12 miles uh, out on a trail is still a, a very good day too. And for that to be the least amount of miles that you ran is, is pretty astounding. And Something that, uh, that I'm thinking about too is, I don't know, I can't think of something that I've been so consistent in for, for 51 days too. Like I wake up and I drink coffee every morning but, and I, I'm sure I have a, a great streak going there, but that, that was your life. You were in that for, for almost two months. But yeah, what, how did you prepare for this? Or no, when did you first decide that you were going to do this? I, so, I mean, I was inspired to do it and kind of just made it a big life goal way back when I was 11 or something. I went on like a youth hiking trip for two nights on the Appalachian Trail and I, well, I mean, I had a really good time and my mind was also just blown that like, what a trip, like this trail, like if I go this way, it goes to Maine and that way it goes to Georgia. Like that's pretty cool. So I, um, so that was the initial inspiration, and I just thought, oh, I'll, I'll I kind of had it on the back burner, like, I'll do it one day, I'll do it when I retire, it just seems like a neat thing to do. Um, but then I think like just little, like I would get little bits of news, like Jennifer Farr Davis, just she when she broke the record on the trail, she broke like the men's and women's record, like she broke the overall record that was in 2011. And I just thought, Oh, that's really inspiring. I wasn't really paying attention to necessarily like trail news or the records, but that was a pretty big deal. And that just, I was like, Oh yeah, I want to do that someday. And then uh, in two, I think it was 2015, Scott Jurek went and broke her record. And he was, I mean, he wasn't the first runner to set a record on the trail. I believe David Horton was in 1991, but, um, it was just, I think it just brought it back into my radar. Cause here's this like really famous ultra runner guy, Scott Jurek, uh, kind of going into like, you know, not it's, I don't know, at least until that point, I hadn't heard of many like runners or like from maybe the, I don't, you know, like mainstream going and doing a big trail like that. Like, yeah, some competitive athletes going in there and, yeah. and taking a shot at a, a thing like that. I, yeah, I mean, and not to say that the people before weren't competitive, I, but, but like someone from maybe specifically, yeah, like the running world like that. And so it just kind of put it on my radar again. And part of me even felt a little jealous. I was like, oh, that's like my thing. I was going to do that. And it's like, well, duh, like it's not, you know, yeah. <laughs> like it's the, the AT is not just for me, but I think it just kind of made me, uh, it just put it on my radar again. And I think, um, I think it was maybe that year that that movie Wild came out too with Reese Witherspoon and I loved that movie. So I don't know, there's all these things that were kind of, I was like, well, maybe, maybe I don't want to wait to do this until I'm 60 or 70. Like maybe I want to do it like pretty soon. So I had big ambitions to, uh, I, I was very into road racing at the time and I had big ambitions to qualify for the U.S. Olympic marathon trials. And I was like, okay, I've been chasing this goal for a really long time. I'll give myself one more Olympic cycle to try and do that. So by January, 2020, and whether or not I make it, I feel like I'm going to be kind of ready to just be okay with whatever happens and maybe look at the summer of 2020 as a transitional time and go on this big, exciting journey and hike the AT. So I just was like, okay, 2020, going to do it. Yeah. It turned out to be a good, good time to get away too. <laughs> yeah. Great time to get out into the woods. Yeah. Little did I know. <laughs> yeah. I remember hearing, uh, when, or in reading about when Scott Jurek broke the record too, because there's that famous, uh, oh, you got a citation for drinking champagne oh, at yeah. the end. And, uh, and that just reminded me of, uh, like the end scene of Monty Python and the Holy Grail, like where they finally come to the end and it's like, oh, there's the grail above the castle. And then, and then they just get arrested and taken oh, away. No. <laughs> it seemed like, oh, he finally made it. Uh, and then he's got to deal with that. Oh, man. Deal with the law. Yeah. It's like, well, at least he made it, but then he got a citation. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's too, too bad. But yeah. Yeah. 
even the interactions I had, like what I, it was pretty soon. I mean, I, I saw a lot of bears. I don't know why I saw so many bears. Really? Like, I just did. Maybe it's because I'm too quiet and I was by myself. So I like just accidentally crept up on them all the time. Like, yeah, not meaning to. What would you do <laughs> in that situation? Would you like, you're like, now go, you go first? Or, or? After you, sir. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, so I know that there's this cougar video that's been going around, like yeah. that guy, like I, so that, I mean, looked really scary and it, it reminded me of the, one of the bear encounters I had, cause I accidentally startled some bear cubs. I heard this like kind of, I don't know, like branches cracking, shuffling sounds. It was in the midst of like a bunch of grass and bushes and but there were trees around too and then I saw these like little cubs scurrying up trees and I was like oh no oh no where's the mama and then like seriously the mama bear comes bursting out of the the overgrown grass and actually like comes at me and it reminded me of that cougar like doing the the bluff charges at the guy yeah and it wasn't for six minutes like that guy but um but there it the bear came at me and I just kind of backed up tried to make myself big and um and it, you know, stopped, but then it decided to come at me again. And so I did the same thing and I was like, oh geez. But like in, in the moment, even though it was really scary in the moment, I felt really calm. And I also just felt this kind of understanding that like this bear does not want to kill me. I, it's just protecting its cubs. It doesn't want me here. It wants to be left alone. Yeah. Uh, and, and it all ended up being fine. I mean, I just waited for a bit and then I, I ended up bushwhacking off the trail and did like a big semicircle around where the bear was. And, and it, I, that actually happened the second time too. I really need to be louder when I'm on the trail. <laughs> so like, animals hear me coming. I feel like other than being terrifying, that would be one of the most frustrating things that you'd have to do. It was like, Hey, this is, you'd have to tell this bear, like, Hey, this is all a misunderstanding. Like, I, I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to fight you. <laughs> like, Hey, Hey, just, just come on. Let's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. So, so I guess that's like kind of just some tying into what we were talking about. I didn't, I wasn't, I mean, like, yes, I was an intruder at that moment, but I also felt like, Oh, we just don't want to be in each other's spaces. This is cool. Like it'll be fine. And, and it was. <laughs> <laughs> you, you became one with the bears. Yeah, now, yes. Yeah, I'll, we'll just give each other high fives next time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're also a very, you're a musical person. And something that I wanted to talk to you about uh, was how music factored into your journey, too. And, uh, and if, I mean, you're out there on this uh, very introspective, uh, solitary journey. And were you, were you being creative while you were out there? Yeah, that, that was something like really unexpected and cool that happened. So um, there were a lot of times I was just very in my head or just trying to get into a zone or find a rhythm. It's like, I, you know, I did have, uh, I, I was always kind of keeping an eye on my watch and, you know, okay, I'd like to like try to get close to three miles per hour or however. And so I very often was just thinking about my footsteps and my um rhythm and oftentimes I'd just kind of make up without even like trying to they just kind of uh come into my head these little melodies and it would usually just be like maybe five or six notes over and over so I mean if like someone else were in my head that would probably be really annoying because it's so repetitious but it I mean hours would go by and and I would just kind of match the music to my footsteps so that that was pretty cool and sometimes it was stuff I'd make up other times it would just be music that I that I know and that I like but um but yeah that that was pretty neat and I had these like reoccurring themes throughout being on the trail that uh when I think of them now it will take me back to like a very specific moment or how I was feeling at the time and so that's kind of cool because I wasn't I mean I had my phone but I really wasn't out you know taking pictures of everything because I was just so focused on what I was doing so when I think of or when I like listen or play the music now it just brings back these really specific memories so it's almost like having a snapshot that is so cool uh because I know yeah like when I when I hear something like a what's a like a middle school dance song or something like that like um, like a that's like something like NSYNC I don't know <laughs> yeah like an NSYNC or like a Casey and Jojo or something like yeah. that like 
that'll take me right back to not dancing with anybody on the dance floor <laughs> in middle school. But it's a very potent feeling. And and for you having those like very um, like heightened experiences out on the trail to have uh, like a little timestamp that can just take you right back into the moment is really cool. And something that I feel only music can do. Uh, maybe for a barbecue pit master, it smells. I don't know. Um, yeah. But smells kind of do that too. They do. There are studies that show that. Yeah. Well, see, I'm not lying here. I mean, this a lot of times I'm very dishonest on this program, but not tonight. This is all truth that, that we're getting. And I've been backing it up with saying, yeah, science said that yeah, <laughs> with right. like no sources whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> Figure it out. Put it in the comment section or something. We're getting a thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the music element. Um, I mean, we've talked about that before and how like running has a as a rhythm and a timing to it. And that's something that music does, too, and that you can tie those two things together in a in a really cool way. And I, I love that that you bring both of those to the to the table, too. And uh, and I know after this, you have brought in uh, we don't have a keyboard here in the garage, but uh, you brought your own and uh, you're going to play some of those um, compositions, if that's what. Is yeah. that what you would call them? I, yeah, I would say so. I mean, they're just like little, they're not really fully fleshed out, but um, but yeah, just like little bits on the piano of what was going on in my head. Little trail bits. Yeah, little trail bits, yeah. I'm really looking forward to that. 